so this is um, this is a bit of a um, um, difficult talk to give. Um, let me let me start by by checking how many in the room consider themselves libertarians. Okay, it's a super majority. Let's call it. Um, so when when I see something like post-libertarian, um, it's with some sadness. Um, I've been a libertarian for, or considered myself a libertarian for about um, 15 years, I think, ever since uh, I read, uh, well, as it often happens, it, it all began with Ayn Rand, surprise, um, and then followed by Rothbard, um, the Freedmans, the, the usual. Um, and uh, it's only in the last few years that I've turned my attention more to science than philosophy. And there's a few things that I want to raise with all of you. Um, but it's with great sympathy uh, to um, libertarians that, that I do this. Um, this is the outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to examine um, what we believe as libertarians, um, the notion of the state as a fiction, and, and perhaps uh, rights are also a fiction. And that is, of course, the basis for libertarian thought and theory. Uh, then we'll look at um, an evolutionary perspective, so switching from philosophy to science. And um, examine some uh, historical questions and then perhaps uh, focus a little bit more on the solution side of things. So let's begin with ontology, uh, what really exists. This um, is probably a familiar sentiment. It's by one of my heroes, Jim Davidson, a digital currency pioneer from way before Bitcoin. I was reading Jim in 1997 and um, haven't been able to meet him yet, but uh, he's an uh, inspiration, and I consider him a mentor. So this is a fairly typical libertarian um, position, that if, we, if a Martian came to Earth and he looked at everything we are doing here, well, um, it would be hard for him to understand that something like a state exists. There exist a lot of people with beliefs uh, there, there exist uh, border controls, there exist government buildings, but does something like the state actually exist? And so it's a fair, fair question. And it depends, of course, of which level of abstraction you're talking about. Uh, the state has no actual corporeal exist existence, but uh, millions of people believe in it, and it's useful to um, think of it as existing. It's a mere abstraction, but a pretty nasty one. Um, but then we have the other side of the coin. Um, so it's easy to point to, haha, statist, uh, you believe in something that doesn't exist, and uh, you're willing to, to kill for it. Uh, but what about us? We, we believe, as libertarians, that uh, um, something we call rights exists. Most of us, I suspect, believe it on a deontological basis or utilitarian basis. Um, those who are merely normative, well, okay. Um, so this is just to point out this image is from Catalonia a few, few days ago. You probably all heard what's going on in Catalonia. Um, people would like to secede, as is happening increasingly around the world and uh, the central government uh, doesn't like this idea, and uh, sent in the army. Um, so uh, this is meant to be just a, a little uh, shock slide, but uh, it's possible, of course, to have a reasonable conversation about what do we mean by rights, and uh, do they really exist in any meaningful sense, is it useful to believe in them, and uh, so on. And where does this belief break down? Um, but one thing I would like to point out is that um, 
rights are really a fundamentally Western concept. It's in, from the Western tradition of uh, philosophy, uh, going back to the, to the Greeks. Um, we are fortunate that something like a notion of rights arose. We are fortunate that some small measure of individual liberty uh, is part of the Western heritage. Um, going through the Magna Carta and going through the levelers and uh, everything in 1600s England uh, through America, it, that's all great. Because the norm in human history has been that if you um, elsewhere in the world and also in the West, uh, if you produce something of value, there was somebody there ready to take it. And people actually, like merchants and, and other people who had some wealth of note, they actually were forced to even bury this wealth in the ground because there was no other way to safe keep it from the grubby hands of the uh, emperors and uh, would-be kings. Um, so if we, if we take a fundamental analysis of rights, um, it's part of our operating system, social operating system. Um, rights are useful when the other person believes in them. If you alone believe in rights, then you could be in some trouble, like with these uh, images of police brutality from Catalonia. Um, it's not so useful that only you believe in it. It takes two parties. And in previous times, no doubt, rights were more useful as a concept to uh, rein in power than, than it is now. And I think one reason for this is that, uh, um, as you all know, I, I suspect the United Nations has defined fundamental human rights in the last 50 years, and uh, they don't make a distinction between negative rights and positive rights. And this means that soon enough, um, internet access will be a fundamental human right, as it is already in my country of origin, Finland. Internet access is a human right. And at that point, the absurdity of the notion begins to be so obvious. Uh, it's so flexible, it can be stretched to cover anything. Uh, does it mean anything at all? And I think this is uh, one, one problem with uh, rights. Um, the other one is that, uh, again, in the last 50 years or so in the West, we don't really subscribe to any, any particularly strong moral system anymore as a, as a society or culture. And uh, with that, um, maybe this is not such a useful concept to cling to. And Frank did a bit of a confession yesterday, I'll do as well. Um, so a self-diagnosis would be that I've come to realize from a lot of reading in, in science that I'm not the most typical human being. I'm not exactly representative of the average. And, um, okay. But um, I suspect neither are most of you in this room. And this means that um, some of you may know this, and for some of, you, some of you it may be news, depending on how much science you read. But we are all a little bit autistic. Uh, we, in, in this um, quadrant that psychologists um, draw, quadrant between <laughs> empathizing on the one hand and uh, systematizing on the other. Um, so you can of course make that into two, two dimensions and you get a nice little box model. Uh, we are in this uh, quadrant, call it the lower right quadrant, or from your point of view, lower right here, um, which is often called Asperger's quadrant. And this means that we are low on uh, empathizing, most of us. I mean, assuming we have a normal distribution here of our kind. Uh, <laughs> but let's assume that for the sake of this talk. Um, and, and we are, let's say, of above average intelligence, yay, <laughs> but that's not so hard. And uh, with that comes um, uh, an ability to systematize, and not just the ability, but desire to systematize things. And I think libertarian theory is <laughs> the great 
ultimate example of something like that. Um, and a related problem is that uh, we, given that we pride ourselves on being rational, uh, at least more rational than average, uh, which is true, actually, um, based, based on psychometrics, um, it still doesn't mean that we should accept this old notion that Aristotle and others put forward that man is the rational animal. We are actually pretty bad at reason. And at best, we are rationalizing. We like to rationalize things to ourselves and to others. And this may be the reason why we have reason, as I'll come to in a bit. And of course, everybody here knows who considers themselves a libertarian. We are not so effective at getting things done in the real world. We like to more play these uh, abstract games in our heads and amongst ourselves. It's a problem. So let's have a very quick overview of uh, a little science. Uh, this has been uh, what I've been reading for the last three, four years at least, instead of philosophy. And uh, there were some revelations. Uh, so one very reasonable question is that uh, if we don't talk about morality as a philosophical system, but instead ask, uh, where does it come from? People have the usual answers. Religious people will say it comes from God. And of course, that was the historical origin of natural rights. Makes a lot of sense. Then natural rights have been uh, recast on a secular ground uh, later. And then we have Rothbard's attempts and, and, and so on to, to, in the ethics of liberty, for example, to um, find some other basis for this, uh, which isn't entirely satisfactory. Um, but if we take the scientific perspective, uh, it's pretty well known at this point where morality comes from. Namely, morality is an, um, something of adaptive value to us as humans. Uh, morality is what uh, allowed small bands of humans, uh, tribes of humans, to outcompete other tribes of humans. Uh, morality, as uh, the social psychologist Jonathan Haidt likes to say, it binds and, uh, binds and blinds us. Uh, so we, um, we can cooperate more efficiently. And it, it confers adaptive value, which means survival value over the generations, survival and reproduction. And uh, there's tons of books on this. I'm ashamed to admit that um, in the first 10 years of being a libertarian, I never read any. But they are readily available. And if, <clears throat> if we talk about what it, what it means that morality is an evolutionary um, adaptation, uh, that its um, origins are in the prehistory of humanity, uh, there's, a, there's a few a few uh, problems to ever again believing in a philosophical view of ethics, let's say. Uh, one, one is that uh, experiments over the past decades conclusively demonstrate our moral reasoning is intuitive and precedes any explanation or, or reasoning process. It's an automatic in intuitive process, and you can have this phenomenon called moral dumbfounding, which means that uh, uh, you, you ask somebody, you describe a scenario to somebody, uh, like let's say, you know, your neighbor um, had a dog, the dog died, and um, the neighbor decided to eat this dog, to not let good meat go to waste, you know. And um, most people have a problem with this. I suspect we in this room, maybe not so much. <laughs> But most people actually have a problem with this, but they have a very hard time explaining why they have a problem with this. Because after all, nobody's being hurt here. Fido was already dead. And is it better that you know, we eat our beloved pet or that some worms and uh, vermin eat him? So there are many, many uh, great examples of moral dumbfounding in the literature. Um, it, it, for example, uh, a very strong, strong effect is found when you um, talk about scenarios involving incest. Uh, in these scenarios, it's pretty much only the libertarians who can be <laughs> non-judgmental. And for the rest of the uh, subjects, 
uh, they have a very strong moral dumbfounding effect and they can't explain why it is bad. Uh, so, so this research shows that uh, um, there's really not much reasoning going on except after the fact. Uh, it's post hoc rationalization all the way. And it's called confabulation. Uh, people come up with some explanation, they reach for anything that fits for why they did something or why they believe something. And uh, we all do it too. And it's good to realize that. And the, the other thing is that uh, twin, twin studies over the past decades have, have really shown that much more human behavior, um, human uh, variability is encoded in our genes than almost anybody would like to believe. And that's a big can of worms in and of itself. Uh, for example, one of the takeaways that I took from, from that is that if you think about something like a small tribe of human beings, call it the Dunbar number 150 or so, uh, this, um, it will be difficult to be a parasite on this tribe because people have always the option to um, exclude you or kill you or move away and so on. But then once we settled down into agricultural societies, uh, this was no longer the case. It was actually possible to have some form of permanent power. And a very nice hypothesis is that, uh, a very interesting one is that psychopathy probably um, confers some evolutionary adaptive value. And the rate of psychopathy in the general population probably increased over the last thousands of years as psychopaths reaped the benefits of, of their uh, different kind of brain, shall we say. Um, so here's the main idea from Jonathan Haidt's research. Um, he has done the best work so far on actually studying what he calls the moral matrix. Moral, moral, reasoning, moral reasoning, moral intuition, and the moral foundations of politics. Uh, this uh, diagram was made by my friend Steve from Berlin, and it's pretty great because it visually conveys what otherwise takes a book to read. And what it conveys is that uh, libertarians are really different. Uh, we, are in, we are in fundamental ways um, unusual. Um, so Jonathan Haidt, when he began his research, he studied, um, he came up with this uh, different um, dimensions of morality. Uh, that can be used in psychometrics, that can be used to measure uh, where people fit on a political spectrum, multidimensional, not just two. And eventually he came up with five dimensions, they are mentioned on the slide, uh, that suffice to explain all human variability. And when, when you had uh, five dimensions, he got two big clusters, which of course are the conservatives and the progressives, pretty much, at least in America. Um, but he also had a smaller third cluster that was confounding him, and he actually had to add a sixth dimension to figure out what's going on. And of course, the third cluster is us. Uh, so we are, our incidence rate in the population is perhaps 10%, something like that. It's pretty small. But in any case, we do exist, and we need a dimension of our own. And uh, that turns out to be the liberty slash oppression dimension. Uh, so, basically, we are pretty much the only ones who deeply care about this dimension. Everybody else, they're lost in the noise, they're, uh, how much they value this dimension. And uh, we don't necessarily care so much about the other dimensions. We, on some of the dimensions, we are similar to conservatives, on some of them, we are similar to liberals. That's why it's always difficult to know where we are, because we are kind of awkwardly in between in multidimensional space. But on this, on this diagram, you can see very clearly that on this liberty oppression dimension, uh, well, it's pretty much us, and the rest of the people basically don't care. And this is Jonathan Haidt. Um, the slides will, of course, be posted. You can read them at leisure. Um, the main takeaways are that, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm sure everybody has noticed this over the years, uh, libertarians and conferences like this are predominantly male. That's about two-thirds male. And um, the other thing is that uh, from all the groups studied, 
uh, libertarians have the highest systematizing scores. So we are the smartest, surprise. <laughs> but that doesn't, you know, that, that's not so significant actually. It's uh, intelligence without wisdom isn't much. And, uh, um, and this is true for, for both overall in the general population and true for uh, each sex separately. Um, and libertarians are very similar to conservatives in understanding notions of fairness. So fairness is one of these dimensions where there's a fundamental split between conservatives and liberals. Uh, so conservatives believe that um, you have to earn something to get something. And we pretty much do too. Uh, liberals, on the other hand, there should be an, enough for everybody. So there's a pretty fundamental split there. On the other hand, conservatives care about things that we and liberals don't care about. So they are very sensitive to, to symbols of authority and, and sanctity. Uh, so for example, desecrating a temple, or um, because they are of course more religious as well overall, desecrating a temple or desecrating a national symbol like a flag, it actually provokes a strong emotional reaction. And to us it's like flatline. So, um, and, and similarly, they have very strong in-group loyalty, uh, so patriotism and, and so on. Um, and for us, it's a difficult concept to even understand. Um, and, uh, and then there's one, one little thing. So on systematizing, we score the highest. But on all measures of emotion, we score lower than the other two groups. So of course, these are averages. Any, any individual here can be different, uh, can be an outlier. And uh, there's a single exception, which is the emotion usually called reactance. And this is basically something that, um, well, I'll, I'll tell a personal anecdote. Um, my father recently gave me um, a letter from my first grade school teacher from the first few days of school. And uh, it basically says that Arthur doesn't want to play with other children. He just sits alone. And um, he doesn't understand that everybody must participate. <laughs> okay, I had forgotten about this incident, but it's somewhat revealing. So that's, that's reactance. Some people, you tell them to jump, they ask how high. Us will ask, why should I? So, psychometrics. Uh, anybody who really believes that what we have is an education problem or persuasion problem uh, hasn't looked at the science. Uh, we, we are not typical and most people will never share our values. They, they value other things and uh, there's really actually no basis for saying that the things we value are better. Uh, evolutionarily, clearly, all of these different uh, um, orientations were, were useful and persisted, and they exist. And we are just one subset of the total human experience. And, and really, people, people don't generally value individual autonomy as much as we do. It, it, they have far higher uh, value on, on sharing or equality or all the things you know. So that's, that's that. So let's, let's talk about uh, oppression. Um, if, we, if we look back in history, there's all kinds of theories of how states arose. I, I like these really naive theories that you have, we all banded together and we decided that we're going to have a government. You know, the civics, civics textbook version of history. Um, if you actually look uh, from a game theoretic perspective, an evolutionary perspective, which is pretty much the same thing, um, or, or just uh, historically, it, it looks a little bit worse. Um, it looks more like uh, this asshole. <laughs> so this is, as far as we know, history's first great conqueror, or as, as we would say, history's first Hitler. And um, he built an empire about uh, 4,200 years ago. Uh, he conquered everybody around him. And we don't know exactly how many people he killed because we have only partial records of his conquests and not of the victim count. But in any case, he or somebody 
slightly before him, is who started this whole great bandwagon of statism. Um, a simplification, of course, but um, in the beginning, Sargon and his ilk, they were like locusts. They, they just took stuff and killed people, and uh, there was nothing left for next year, there was no future. So it was like a, with 5,000 men, not a very big army by modern standards, uh, but 5,000 men armed with uh, bronze weapons, he was able to, to subdue his neighbors and take their stuff. Um, good, good beginning to all that. And he did one mistake as well. He, he basically extracted so much resources that there was nothing left anymore. So it, it took a long time before he could steal from anybody again. And uh, over the subsequent generations, this was perfected into what we now know as uh, tribute or taxation. So basically, if you don't kill people and they don't take all of their stuff, then you can come back every year and take a little bit of their stuff. And that was a pretty significant invention. <laughs> so the historical timeline looks something like that. Um, my, my point here is that, uh, like echoing Frank from yesterday, there are many drivers of history, but some are necessary. Um, the, the most important one, necessarily the most important ones, and technology is really the big one. Um, there's a great many items on this list that fundamentally changed human society, changed civilization, and uh, let's look a little bit at that. So, I, I claim that uh, while we can, we can recognize many drivers of history, we can recognize many reasons why societies are organized the way they are, um, or how individual autonomy is curtailed, there is ultimately, it all comes down to one thing, it comes down to physical force. If you can defend yourself from the privations of uh, assholes like Sargon, then in this case, it doesn't matter so much what your ideas are, what the ideas are, whether they believe in rights and, and so on. Um, it, it always comes down, ultimately, to physical force. And uh, one of my favorite examples in, in, uh, in history of how big a difference um, technology made and uh, how big the gulf, gulf between before and after was is, of course, the introduction of cannon into Europe. So this is uh, Louis XIV's little toy. Um, the inscription in Latin says, the last argument of kings. And uh, that makes perfect sense. You know, you'll try diplomacy, and then like Clausewitz said, war is a continuation of politics by other means. So, he of course made a lot of use of this canon. And Europe, circa 1300, and Europe circa 1700, looks entirely different. We have, as you know, hundreds of city-states on the one hand, and on the other, uh, the rise of the nation-state and, and empires. So the other part of this uh, notion about the balance of power is of course the defensive one. And the other claim I'm making is that the marginal cost of oppression has been on the rise for the last few centuries. And th this, is a, this is actually a pretty useful notion. Um, so marginal cost is probably familiar from economics, but, but if not, it's about the additional units. So in, in this case, it's, it's pretty simple to understand. Um, let's say that, uh, think about the cost of the state, whether it's the, the Czech state or it's the German state, American state. Think about the cost of them oppressing you. Think about the cost of them coming to your home, kicking in your door, dragging you to prison. Uh, this cost is pretty small. Namely, this marginal cost of oppressing you in addition to everybody else is pretty small. Um, so it's almost like a zero-cost oppression. Um, because it's a well-oiled well machine uh, perfected over generations. And uh, that's, that's the one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is what are your possibilities for defending yourself? And of course, right now, they're not so great. They come to your house, they kick in your door, uh, well, you probably want to cooperate, or, or you'll be dead uh, by the evening. So, not so great. However, um, 
it's, it's pretty clear that your chances, if you decided to do some sort of crazy last action, um, decided to defend yourself, your chances are better than that of a medieval, those of a medieval peasant. A medieval peasant, um, he didn't have too many options. Certainly not for sticks to defend himself with. Brave heart notwithstanding. And uh, today, uh, in some countries, or actually any country, if you go to the uh, dark markets, you can obtain uh, firearms fairly cheap, probably only five times the American cost over here, I would imagine, I don't really know. And uh, you, can, you can fairly effectively defend yourself. Uh, you won't win, but you can defend yourself. And you can impose some cost on the uh, oppressor, on the attacker. Um, so let's, let's think about the limiting case. What would it take? What would it take uh, for nobody to want to mess with you? How badass would you have to be so that nobody dared to mess with you? I mean, you have to remember, even, even this crazy Kim Jong-un, he's uh, only semi-immune. There are rumblings about taking him down. But, okay, if you were something like a character out of Neil Stevenson's book, that I'm sure everybody has read, in this case, you would look like this. Uh, your name would be Raven, and you would be driving around on a motorcycle that has a nuke. And this nuke is... Uh, rigged to a dead man's switch. So, messing with you is a pretty bad idea. Uh, it could be called an example of a weakly godlike defensive technology. And uh, I'll go... There's, there's a lot of case examples. I'm thinking of writing all this up as a book, and there's some things I'm researching. But I'm going to go fairly quickly, go, go through a couple of examples. So, some of you may know uh, in America, there's a movement called the Sovereign Citizen Movement. They are not libertarians. Uh, many of them are not even good people by our standards. But uh, some of them, um, like this guy here, John Joe Gray, have managed to live free despite living in, this, in Mordor, in this oppressive uh, bureaucracy and, and superstate. Um, so, he is charged with two felonies 15 years ago, or by now more than that, and nobody went in and got him even though they know exactly where he lives. The reason is pretty simple. Um, Gray has eight children, a wife, and they are all armed to the teeth. <laughs> so the cost-benefit calculation is really clear. You can get him, you can always win, the state will always win, but you will take some casualties. And the local sheriffs, four in a row, they have recognized this and they have decided not to pursue the matter. So he, he is actually still a free man. Uh, another example, some of you may know, there's a tribe of people in, in uh, Virginia, America, called the Wolves of Vinland. Um, in my bibliography I include some of their writings. And uh, they're a pretty interesting example as well. They, they haven't, as far as I know, they haven't had any direct conflict with authorities so far. But uh, if such conflict comes, and no doubt uh, it's always an eventuality, uh, they are, shall we say, more prepared than most. Um, I'll, I'll uh, have to move ahead, or there won't be time to finish. Uh, so. Those were some of the examples of the um, historically where did oppression begin? Um, what does the balance of power mean uh, from the offensive side? And then if you wanted to defend yourself against the state, um, what are your defensive, uh, what's the defensive equation? Uh, let's, let's talk about the conclusion. Um, <clears throat> so I have a fairly pessimistic view on libertarian activities to liberate the world. Um, and um, I, I would uh, perhaps summarize it best as I, I don't think uh, persuasion is effective, I don't think education is effective, um, I don't think there's any hope of liberating the world. Uh, I think the best we can do is um, those of us who actually have this affliction to want to be free. And it is an affliction, it's, it's, the incidence rate is not that high. Um, we have some options, but they are based on changing this uh, balance of power. 
and it's not, not just us changing it, but if we can change the, the marginal cost of operation, if we can, in other words, make it more expensive for the state to come in and kick your door, it doesn't mean that the costs have to be paid immediately. It doesn't have, mean that they have to suffer casualties. It can, for example, be something like, you know, if you mess with anonymous, there's going to be some consequence. Now, it's not a very effective consequence. They'll, you know, they'll deface a few websites, and next day everything will be okay again. But imagine if you had something like a, the anonymous collective with teeth. I, imagine if. Um, um, arresting an anonymous member doesn't just mean that the FBI's website gets defaced, but that there are consequences uh, beyond that. That's changing the, the equation. <clears throat> and as I said, I don't believe libertarians have really, in, in this traditional uh, theory, uh, much, of a, much of a chance because it's, it's, it's really not about convincing everybody. It's, it, that's, that's not a door that's open. Uh, we, we need to have some credible deterrence um, for acting against us, I mean those of us who, who wish to be free, and if there is an act by the state against us that's unjustified, you know, occasionally it can be that the state actually arrests somebody who should be arrested, um, then there needs to be a consequence. And right now, those things are not even on the horizon. So we are right now, we are soft targets. And if we ever want to be something more, we have to become hard targets. <clears throat> we have to speak softly and carry a big stick. So, um, my take on liberty, um, as, as it can be achieved in this world of ours, is that I'd be happy with diplomatic immunity. Uh, if, if as I travel through the globe, uh, around the globe, and as I have to interact with this uh, border controls and whatnot, I can always take the VIP lane, that'd be a good start. And um, similarly, if local laws were enforced a little bit laxer for the non-free subject population, the cattle, versus those who, uh, shall we say, it's more dangerous to mess with, then that'd be a good start. And of course, such situations exist. We have criminal gangs, for example. Everybody knows that if somebody is signaling uh, with a lot of tattoos and shaved head and so on, um, a leather jacket that you don't dare take off him or you're dead, um, you, you know that you, you treat this person more carefully. Uh, he has some extra privileges in life, some cheat codes. And something like that is what we need if we wish to be free. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that conflict is actually expensive even for the state. Even this well-oiled machine that's going to come and get you through your five-inch five steel door, um, there's going to be some cost to it. There's going to be, for example, a public relations cost, um, even if you don't defend yourself. Conceivably, there can be a cost that's, for example, non-physical. Non and these costs are real enough to the bureaucrats who, who are not involved in the action in any case. Uh, and animals uh, developed territorial instincts. Maybe some of you remember Eric S. Raymond um, from his writings in the 90s. He makes exactly this point. Animals develop territorial instincts because even when you win the fight, it means you're weakened against the next one who wants to try you. So it's best to avoid conflict when possible. Um, so, solution-wise, um, I don't believe that the lone wolf has much of a chance. The only thing you can do as a lone wolf is hide. Hide and scurry away like rats. And that's actually a viable strategy. I know many people who do this. Um, so, it can work, but it means you'll, you'll never, never live in the light, so to say. So, I think uh, it's necessary to find other people um, who you can ally with, and I think it's necessary to form some social bonds, as difficult as it is for semi-autistic people. Um, I, I know it's not so easy for me either. So, um, it's Neil Stevenson, 
um, wrote about a concept called files in his Diamond Age, and that actually pretty much means tribe. As you may remember, those of you who were here last year, uh, Frank and Smuggler spoke about crypto tribalism, and uh, let's just say there's something to that, and people who who are inclined that way might want to investigate, and in particular, I include um, significant bibliography on the, on the topic. Um, so it, psychologists have this concept of in-group and out-group. Um, one of the problems with libertarian thinking is that we are meant to be universalists. We inherit this, uh, this, this notion of uh, we should care equally for, for everybody and the same rights and, and so on apply to everybody. And this is something that uh, I've come to, to reject. All of us actually care, or at least should care, uh, more about our family than a stranger. We care more about our f uh, friends than a stranger. And uh, perhaps there's room in that hierarchy for one more slot, something that right now is absent in most people in this room. There's not a strong primary loyalty to anything. Uh, the nation state certainly doesn't command any loyalty from, from most of us. The concept is a mere abstraction and an abhorrent one. Um, so there's actually a big gap from the family and friends to, well, what? Some of you may belong to a religion that can fulfill some of that. Um, but there's, uh, there used to be a few more slots in between for your tribe and your clan and, and your extended kin and, and so on. And maybe it's time to, to, to try to fill those slots again. They, they're actually waiting in the psyche, empty, ready to be filled. <clears throat> so that's pretty much um, the gist of the talk. Uh, there's some bibliography, pretty significant at the end. You can get it from the posted slides. There's the fiction side uh, that deals with most of the things I've talked about. And as we go towards the end of the list, it becomes increasingly radical. Um, some of these books are, shall we say, banned books. Uh, for example, US border customs will, has been known to confiscate them in the past. And uh, they are known as domestic terrorism writings. So, careful. And then we have the nonfiction side of things. And uh, that list could go on for a lot longer, but I'm gonna got to fit it on a slide. Uh, so, so that's pretty much what I have to say, and I would open it to questions. Thank you very much uh, for your speech. And uh, even if uh, usually the moderator is asking the first question, this time we have probably time just for like one of them. So I will leave it to the audience. But uh, I really liked your presentation and Thank even you. if I don't agree with everything, I really enjoyed your speak Thank speech. You. Thank you. So who was the only question? Uh, ah. Okay, there are two guys. I must decide somehow. Three even. Three, well, the two were First, but you are first. Okay. Uh, it's just one question, so I will give it with the one with the liberate T-shirt. So uh, you mentioned actually founding or finding your in-group. Um, do you have any recommendations on vetting that group? Uh, can you repeat the last part? On Do vetting, uh, trying to determine whether or not these people are trustworthy and uh, well, not that's, agents. There's no shortcut to that, of course. That's, trust is something established over a period of time. Um, of course, you can, um, in, let's say in, in, in some of the examples I mentioned, motorcycle gangs and the like, um, there are things known as initiation rituals, and there's a process for a novice to, to uh, be indoctrinated and, and become a full member. And perhaps it might be an idea to copy some of those things. Well, this was fast, so one more. Um, I, I think that in this talk, and uh, it's a thing libertarians usually do, is that we overestimate our importance 
And uh, if we look at the modern state, it's no longer like the efficient oppression machine of uh, Sagan of Arcade or Louis XIV. Instead, it's like uh, a bunch of very dysfunctional bureaucracies that are fighting each other over the scraps. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's, they, they're kind of like their own worst enemy. Uh, I'll, I'll take that as more as a comment than a question. I, I, do, I do agree to OK, to then extent. one more. Uh, then might I ask you, in one of your slides, you pointed out uh, a series of things that would not be dominant forms of political organization as the 21st century end. Certain things that would not survive, the state being one. Might I ask you what you think could survive or would end up being seen as the dominant political organizational system of the century of 21st? Uh, certainly. I, I, I do think that we are seeing a return to something like city-states. Uh, even, even what's happening in Catalonia right now is, is effectively the most important city-state on that uh, peninsula uh, seceding. And I, I do think city-states will become important again. Well, you're probably one of the fastest answering people, so I will give you, even that's my question, I wanted from the beginning. Uh, I know that research you presented of that liberals, conservatives and libertarians, and I am not sure if it's the how you and even the author is uh, somehow what he's deriving from the result. I mean, the thing that the people are answering like this and they are like that doesn't mean that it can't change. Don't you think that with that education and stuff the people can change even inside and emotionally because I actually think he can and I saw it around myself in many times. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good question. and. Um, I, what I would say is that um, the capabilities of an individual are almost limitless. Uh, there are always exceptions, there are outliers. Uh, however, uh, these researchers, they deal with uh, averages and statistics. And uh, so we can, we can generalize across groups. We can't necessarily say uh, that such an individual doesn't exist, or we can't predict what you would do in some case. Uh, we, can predict what kind of friends you have, and, and, and so on. But uh, we can and, and should generalize across populations. Yes, I meant something else. I meant if, uh, what if, what if it can change by the education, for example? Um, well, my understanding is that um, so no, nobody's born a libertarian. But what, what, what you are, it seems, born with is uh, some um, orientation, shall we say that uh, you, you are already leaning, leaning in a certain direction, and then as you mature and you can develop your, um, your mind and, and your political beliefs, um, you probably latch on to something that fits. Um, and uh, yes, edu education can be a part of that, but it's basically we have this nudge in a certain direction, and if that nudge is in some other direction, uh, then let's say, somebody will read Ayn Rand and it won't resonate at all. For me, I read Ayn Rand, it resonated. And uh, I think it's the same for, for many, many here. Okay, thank you very much.